Can you steel man the arguments for the various ways Omicron might have evolved from a 2020 strain without being noticed by the medical community that has been sequencing as many variants as they find? To the naive, engineered seems like a possibility, but I would like to hear other natural evolutionary solutions to the problem. Yeah, so the answer is kind of a yes and no. I think we can steel man the general category. Mm -hmm. I do want to say, I think I said something last week uh, that I wanted to correct this week. I mm. think I suggested that the spike in the Omicron variant doesn't have uh, mutations, doesn't have alterations. Mutations is actually yeah. the wrong term because those mutations are then um, either selected or not. But yeah. um, mutation has been a confusing term here. But nonetheless, there are something like 30 alterations to the spike protein that makes um, a lot more sense that you know yeah. that's, that's much more in keeping with what you know that seems to be the most quickly evolving part of, of right. the virus on yep. the other hand actually zach would you show what we've got here is somebody has put together a time lapse animation of the phylogeny of different strains and mm -hmm. i should just say to our audience um molecular phylogenetics has never been our bag particularly we've been in and around it we've used it occasionally but it's not our specialty but we do have a rather deep history in fact we learned from the best we learned from arnold kluge who was philosophically so deep um, that we really got the full strength uh, introduction into what phylogenetic systematics is and why it works the way it does. So let's just give two sentences of explanation. Phylogenetics or phylogenetic systematics is the sort of origin of species half of evolution, wherein we are trying to determine relationships between species, or in this case, variants of a virus, as opposed to the sort of, sort of half of evolution where we tend to spend more of our time talking here, which is at the sort of population level. Um, how do, uh, how how do, <clears throat> excuse me, characters or in the case of viruses, variants arise and what kinds of selective pressures allow them to actually expand in numbers in a population or, or recede. And so systematics being the sort of the macroevolutionary side um, can, can use a number of types of information to build the trees. And, you know, historically and, and Kluge, who was my major advisor, uh, typically used morphological characters uh, like, like bone and muscle. Uh, you can also use developmental characters. And then, of course, the sort of molecular revolution that began in the 90s uh, would seem to have overwhelmed uh, the use of other uh, slower to code characters like morphological data sets. Uh, once sequencing came online and, and became cheap enough for people to do uh, in a lot of labs. Uh, but really, as we learned from Arnold, as we learned from Dr. Kluge, a total evidence approach in which you, which you look at data from all all of the angles and look for consilience between them is likely to be the best. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> at some point, we ought to have this this conversation. Yeah. I, I I would not divide the two evolutionary biologies as as you've just laid it out. I mean, obviously, I that see is the traditional divide that everyone everyone who's had you know had a, a week of evolution anywhere will have heard macroevolution versus microevolution. Right. But uh, yeah. you know, as you know, I. Uh, differ with most of our colleagues on um, the relationship between adaptation and macroevolution. So anyway, uh, I think there's a better way to do it. And just for the from the point of view of of our listeners and viewers, phylogenetic systematics is about describing the tree shape itself. What is more closely related to what than what else? Right, mm -hmm. the shape of the tree. And then the other part is the study of why things look the way they do or function the way they do. And so just one more, uh, for those of you who have, who have read our book, chapter two of the 13 chapters does the sort of deep history of what are the changes uh, that we think we know about uh, the lineage to which we belong, the three and a half billion ish uh, year lineage to which we belong. Uh, and so, you know, we have I think three, four, five trees, phylogenetic trees in that chapter that describe, uh, you know, the current best understanding. And really, you know, we only included trees where there's, you know, it's we're really very, very certain um, that these are the relationships. Yeah, and at the, you know, you as you zoom back out on a tree, the relationships become much more secure, mm -hmm. right? There are yeah. lots of very subtle variations, very in the you know nitty gritty at the tips of the branches, but it, you know, between yeah. big groups, that they're much clearer. Anyway, Zach, did you find the? Uh, uh, if you click on the tweet, well, people will get the gist. 
Okay, so what this, so actually this points out in part why macroevolution might be the wrong term because this is all microevolutionary change. So these are all the variants that are being tracked, and the line. What's that, the x? I mean, the x-axis is presumably time, time, but when does it start? What's the, what's the leftmost? Uh, Zach will have to read it. I think it's like mid twenty twenty, or maybe it's early twenty twenty. Twenty nineteen. Yeah. Okay. okay. So it starts right at the beginning of the sort of named pandemic. Mm -hmm. And what you have are all of the variants and their relationships as deduced by their sequence, sequence differences. Mm -hmm. And what you saw is that Omicron pops up uh, without any history of connection to the rest of this swarm uh, as if it came about somewhere March through September of 2020. 2020? Yes. So it's sh it, you know, not 2021. Omicron? 2020? It showed, no, it shows up in 2021. But the point is, its relationship, it is as if it has been frozen in time uh, at a much earlier state and then oh. shows up. Now, the thing is, this has people over in Lab Leak world fascinated. Mm -hmm. Because this is not the first time in history that this has happened. In fact, there's a very famous example that you may have just barely heard mentioned in the lab leak discussion about the uh, flu of 1977. And the flu of 1977, it has been concluded, this of course could be revised if some better model emerged that was more predictive or assumed less. But it has been concluded for now and with substantial evidence is actually a lab escapee. And the way we know that is that its closest relative dates back to 1949. So it vanished from the world, mm. and then the clock started again on its evolution in 1977. So that indicated this surely was in a fridge somewhere or isolated from the world. Whatever was happening with it, um, effectively time was stopped, and that effectively yeah. requires a refrigerator. In an, in an organism or, or a virus um, that does not have extraordinarily variable mutation rates, um, you, do, you, you would not, you could not possibly expect a, whatever that would have been, a 28-year hiatus with no changes. Right. Yeah. And so the other example that we have of this, which isn't as good because we don't really have a good uh, ancestor, right, we, is, is, uh, SARS-CoV-2 itself, mm -hmm. where we suddenly have a virus that's very, very good at doing the things a virus needs to do in order to become a human pandemic with no history of circulating in another animal where it learned those tricks, no history of circulating in some population of humans as far as we can tell somewhere. It just, it's a genius right off the, it's like a child that was born uh, speaking three languages or something, you know? Yeah. Um, and so anyway, this has people who are paying attention to this thinking very carefully about well, what could even explain this other than it having been somewhere in someone's lab during the period of time that we would have expected it to emerge and then suddenly popping back up? Um, and there are other anomalies too, like uh, things like the, um, the non-synonymous to synonymous mutation rate is way off of normal. Um, it's like 25 to 1. So this is about how many alterations that have no consequence for uh, actual protein sequence you would expect for every one that has an actual consequence. And the number appears impossible through a normal process. Now, what the mm -hmm. Discord server has asked us to answer is the question of, well, could it be, you know, what, what might explain uh, this, this variant with this many changes uh, appearing so suddenly given a a supposed background rate of so many people checking all the time for variants. Right. And so what I think we should do, rather than search the world for crazy explanations, is just identify one. So you've heard things like um, immunocompromised person in which much more evolution took place than normal because their immunocompromised state effectively created a gain of function environment, a serial passage environment between tissues that was extremely favorable to variants. Now, this doesn't make a lot of sense to me because, um, and in fact, I think the idea, so it was originally reported that it had been isolated from somebody with HIV, right. undiagnosed HIV. I believe that that has been debunked, although who even knows what debunked means in 2021. But uh, nonetheless, these kinds of explanations have been offered before. In fact, there was one 
quite good paper. I thought it was dead wrong, but quite good paper that argued that it could be that SARS-CoV-2 uh, experienced extreme evolutionary change in one of the miners who got sick in mm -hmm. Yunnan province because lungs have such a large surface area. Yeah, back very, in 2013. Yeah, it was a yeah. very clever argument. Again, I think it's dead wrong. But anyway, it's at least the kind of thought you would want to have. How could you get more evolution than you expect? Right? Maybe surface area is the answer. Well, and at least in that case, it it you, you can track the story evolutionarily. Like the logic, each logical step is plausible, even if one, one or more of them may be so unlikely as for it not to have happened. So many of these stories that are trotted out, these these explanations that are you know thrown out at at the masses and then uh, and then the guy in effectively the white lab coat steps out to say I know you can't follow this so let me just tell you the conclusion is um, actually just don't even logically hold together and you know this you, <clears throat> we've sort of <clears throat> excuse me we sort of stopped you and I have stopped largely coming on here and saying, oh, this thing, except it doesn't make sense and this thing except it doesn't make sense because it's just coming so fast and furious like this I, I don't on the face of it, the idea that immunocompromised creates gain of function in a body, I don't, I don't know why that would be true. I haven't, I have yet to hear the explanation for how you get from A to B. That's just a simple A to B. Spell it out. Like what? Well, the idea, the idea to the extent that it is an idea yeah. rather than an excuse is um, in the immunocompromised body, the defenses that would ordinarily silence lots of evolutionary experiments in the body tolerates them, right? Something like that. And so you have, it's like a big population in which processes that wouldn't make any headway in a small population gets a chance. But Again, do we have, I mean, so if, if that is true, yeah. you would expect that immunocompromised people would tend to be incubators of uh, of lots of variations in colds, other coronaviruses, or flus, or you know any of the right. other things. So it makes other predictions, and frankly, right. I don't and know whether any so, of those predictions are manifest. Um, right, the that's, other that, thing, that's how you would actually follow this up with a scientific approach. The other thing would be Okay, so let's say that this is true in yeah. the immunocompromised person, and you get lots of evolution of little, you know, there are lots of foothills in the immunocompromised person that don't exist in people with a, a fully competent immune system. But then when the variant gets out into people who do have a fully competent immune system, you wouldn't expect those variations to function very right. well. Unless, if they only got a foothold because of immune suppression. Right. Yeah. So then you would need another step to the process and the point is this is where you start running afoul of Occam's razor it's you're not just you're not just hypothesizing an immunocompromised person which provides a unique environment you're you've got another black box that you need to fill and right. at some point it's too many epicycles to be sustained so I would just I just want to point out the other thing that we talked about last week that fits this category is the why did uh why did COVID-19 collapse in Japan oh yes after they allowed doctors to prescribe ivermectin and the answer was oh uh it became mutationally aggressive and uh lost its coherence and it's like it just did so well that it failed Right, something. And so the answer is no, you need at least one more factor. You know what one factor could do it? Ivermectin could drive a virus to make some sort of a, a deal that it couldn't sustain, but you yeah. can't do it just spontaneous mutational idiocy.